Well, good morning, South Union, and welcome back to another wonderful Lord's Day. Welcome to each and every one of you who are here with us today. Welcome to all of our guests and to all those who are listening in online with us. Now we're at a later time. Welcome. Let us bow our heads in a word of prayer. Our Father, in the name of the Lord Jesus and in the power of your Holy Spirit, we come before your throne of grace. Father, we thank you for the generous privilege that we have in coming to pray before your throne and before you, the most holy, the greatest, the one and only. We thank you. We thank you for your treasured and precious gift of your Son, Jesus Christ who died on the cross to cleanse us of our sin, who rose again to defeat death. Jesus, we thank you that you are alive and well, seated at the right hand of God. Father in Jesus, we thank you so much for your Holy Spirit, who is given to us as a down payment of our salvation, who dwells in us like we are a temple, we thank you. We thank you so very much that salvation is by grace through faith. Nothing that we have done or could do, nothing that we have earned, but solely a gift. Oh, Father, we thank you. We thank you. Now, Lord Jesus, we come before you and we ask that you would teach us and minister to our hearts and minds here this morning. We may understand more of your word and that that might then translate into what we do. Father, for those who need a word of teaching or instruction, I pray that you give it. For those who need a word of counsel or a word of rebuke or a word of challenge, I pray that you would give it. Father, for those who need a building up and edification, I pray that you would encourage them. Holy Spirit, please come. In your name do we pray, Lord Jesus. Amen. How do we discern matters in the gray areas of life? Today, we finally wrap up Paul's argument about meat sacrificed in the temple. Two main guardrails are going to be given by Paul here in his final word on meat sacrificed in the temple. The first guardrail is, do not commit adultery. The second guardrail is something we've been hearing for many weeks. Do not put a stumbling block before another. Today I'm looking to equip you with being able to discern the gray areas of life through these two guardrails and a third biblical principle I'll give later on. We are winding down Paul's arguments today and, and his teaching on meat that has been sacrificed to idols, which actually began in chapter 8. Paul has just given a powerful warning about the consequences for the elect of them committing idolatry and other forms of sin. And he's done that in chapter 10, verses 1 through 13. We found that it resulted in the destruction of many of those who were chosen by God to be the people of God in the desert before ever reaching the promised land. And it's here at which we enter Paul's arguments, his closing remarks. And he says in verse 14, Therefore, my beloved, flee from idolatry. Guardrail number one, do not worship another god. Now he's going to be using an argument based on logic by which he makes the appeal, I speak as to sensible people. Judge for yourselves what I say. 
So he's going to be talking with them. He's reasoning with them about an argument to which they would be familiar with. And so we're going to be talking about how religion worked 2,000 years ago and how it still works today in communion. So let's take a look. Verse 16, the cup of blessing that we bless, is it not a participation in the blood of Christ? The bread that we break, is it not a participation in the body of Christ? Well, what's he mean? What's he talking about here? What does the word participate mean? First, we need to understand that this is not talking about every time we take communion, that that actually is the body and blood of Christ. We know that those elements are symbolic. And so we, we understand the symbolism there, but what does it mean to participate in the blood of Christ, to participate in the body of Christ? You might as well leave your bulletin there in Corinthians and turn with me to the book of Galatians. Just a few letters down to the right. You want to open up to Galatians chapter 2. Verse 20. And while you do so, I want to define participation in the way that Paul is talking about it. Participation in Christ means this. That we so identify with the cross of Christ that we too have died with him. That we so have identified with the resurrection of Christ that we have risen with with him. And we're going to pause there and just let that soak in and sink for a minute. Let's read Galatians chapter 2 verse 20 to find out more about this participation. I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life I now live in the flesh I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. This is one of the most critical and crucial passages that a Christian can memorize right here as it talks about participation. What does it mean? Well, let's just establish the gospel. Jesus came, he's the Son of God, and he died on the cross for our sin. He died on the cross, paying, our, paying the price for our sin, taking the punishment, taking the wrath of God. He did that for us. And he rose again from the dead on the third day, never to die again. An eternal, resurrected body. That's historical fact. That's truth. How do we access that and participate in it? We receive Jesus as Lord and Savior by faith. Those are the foundations of the gospel. But Paul also understands this about those very events. I have been crucified with Christ. What does it mean? I am dead to sin. I am dead to my old person, the old way of life, the old way of living. Everything that made me me in the old self is now dead. Why? Because I too have been crucified with Christ. What does that mean? If I'm dead, it means I can't live. Who lives instead? Christ. Galatians chapter 2, verse 20. I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. Well, how is that? Well, just as Christ rose from the dead, so too I rise. I am a new creation. Typical language would just say born again, right? There is something new about us, and that is linked to Christ being in us through the power of his Holy Spirit. His lifestyle, his way of doing things, his very mindset, everything about Christ is now alive in me. And the life, therefore, that I live, 
in the flesh, meaning right here, right now, this life that I live, I live by faith in the Son of God. How do we live like Christ? By faith. By faith in Him we live. Why do we do this? Because He is the one who loved me and gave Himself for me. To participate in Christ means that we so identify with the life of Christ that we no longer live, but Christ lives in us. And when we partake of the communion cup and we eat the communion bread, we remind ourselves and we are reminded by God that we are participating in the life of Christ, that we have died and that it is now Christ who lives in me. There's this intimate association, this intimate identification, this intimate participation in the life of Christ. And that's part of what's happening at the communion table, is that truth is being proclaimed to us. Turn back with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 10 and we'll go on. Take a look at what Paul also says. Because there is one bread, we who are many are one body, for we all partake of the one bread. What's he saying? He'll say this elsewhere in 1 Corinthians. The church is the body of Christ. What does that mean? How does Christ do his will here on earth now? It's through his body. Just as we carry out our wills from our mind by enabling and using our body, so too Christ uses us to carry out his will. We are all members of one body. And that truth is proclaimed as we partake of what? The one bread. Okay? Participation with Christ and in Christ. Paul then elaborates on this in verse 18 by giving us another example from the history of Israel. Consider the people of Israel are not those who eat the sacrifices participants in the altar. What does it mean? Well, for several different offerings, they participate in what happens on the altar. First, the priests participate with what's on the altar by taking some to consume, and they're consuming part of the holy offering to God. And they themselves must eat that offering in a holy place. With the burnt offering, the burnt offering means uh, that, that an entire animal is consumed. Every last bit of it is consumed as an offering up to God. What that is, is actually a participation. It's the, it's the person offering that to God and saying, this should be me, but you are accepting it as a guilt offering on my behalf. There's a participation in what's happening there. All right, with the peace offering, they offer up a portion to God, the priests get some, and then the people get some as a free thanks, a thankfulness to God and His provision. It is a participation in what's happening on the altar. And so Paul is going to be making use of this participation aspect of the argument and saying this, basically, as we go forward, he's going to say, we cannot participate in two different gods with these sorts of events. We cannot identify in two ways with them. It must be all in one or all in the other. Look at this here in verse 19. What do I imply then? That food offered to idols is anything? Or that an idol is anything? Now Paul is going to stand in the prophetic tradition here and say, no, an idol is nothing. It's merely wood. It's merely stone. It's merely whatever. That's nothing. But there is a spiritual reality behind the idols. Look here in verse 20. No, I imply that what pagan sacrifice they offer to demons and not to God. 
In their offering, they are participating in, they are identifying with the lifestyle of the demon or the so-called God that they are sacrificing to. So verse 21 makes it profoundly clear what Paul is saying. You cannot drink the cup of the Lord and the cup of demons. You cannot partake of the table of the Lord and the table of demons. It's got to be one or the other. So let me, let me just clarify this further. What Paul is saying is that in the religious feasts, in the eating of the sacrificed meat in the temple complex, where they are close proximity to the idol, where they're participating in the meaning of the ritual, they cannot eat that sort of meat. Why? It's a participation with the demons. And you cannot participate in communion and participate with demons. It's abomination. And then Paul reminds them of the stern warning they have just received throughout chapter 10. Shall we provoke the Lord to jealousy? Are we stronger than he? Simply meaning this. God punished his chosen people that he delivered from Egypt. Do not think he will not do the same in the church if these sorts of idolatrous practices are followed, O Corinthians. So what does this mean for us? Let's talk a moment about a practical application here that we can, we can apply first. For the Christian... There is no such thing as being able to go to a fortune teller or practicing a horoscope or participating in rituals that celebrate or exalt another. What do I mean by this? I mean even this. If you were invited by a Muslim friend to partake in their religious festival, this text is outruling that. I'm sorry, you cannot participate with their God when you are sworn to Christ. Participating in even other religious services is questionable. Why? Because it would be participating to that other God. All such practices are outlined. Why? You cannot mix and match. You cannot take partake of the table of the Lord, and you cannot then partake of any other religion or any other religious festivals or practices or, or cultic scenarios. You cannot do both. It's one or the other. You are sworn to Jesus, therefore you cannot swear to another. It would be like this, just as an example. We as the church are the bride of Christ. It means that we're, we're in some ways married to Christ. We're devoted to Him. Now imagine in a, in a married relationship, imagine with your own spouse, that your spouse suddenly said to you, no, I just want to go on a few dates with other people. Just see what it's like. I, I, just, I hear they have some interesting stories. I, I just want to hear about them. Just want to explore and just... I, I'm, I won't do anything with it. I really won't mean it. But I just want to test the waters, so to speak. Try it out. That's what it would be like to go to another religious festival for the Lord. The Lord is standing over here and saying, I did what for you? I died for you. I rose again for you. I'm giving you eternal life. And you're now going to go mess around and put your feet in another waters? Test, you're going to go date some other gods? What's the reaction? How dare you? Never. No. Not ever. Many of us may need to apologize to God if we've been deluded into the quote-unquote open mind scenario in America where it's okay to go and try and experiment other religions just to get to know people better. This text outrules that and outlaws it. Now we then move into the second section. 
In the second section, it's the gray area because that's pretty black and white. That's pretty clear for us. The next is the gray, and it's this. Well, what do we do with all the meat that's in the meat market? This is why it's, it's a specific direction where Paul is going before. It's specifically eating meat that has been sacrificed to an idol while in the temple complex or during a religious feast or celebration. Now the question is, more or less for them, well, what happens if we go to Kroger's and get some meat? That, that would be their question here. What, what do we do next? What do we do with meat in the meat market? Here's the background. Nearly 100% of the meat in the meat market would have been at some point sacrificed to an idol. That's how it works. In the, in the temples, they sacrifice the meat to the idols. They serve some diners there. That's kind of like their modern day restaurant. They would have served some diners there or it would have been offered in a, in a religious festival. But what do they do with the rest of the meat? Well, much of it then goes and is trafficked outward and sold on the streets in the meat market. That's where you would get your meat. There is no such thing as a secular butcher. Your butcher is a priest of some sort. So now Paul is addressing this issue. What is he going to say? Verse 23. This most likely starts off as a corollary to the gospel that was preached, but it was taken too far. So now he corrects it. All things are lawful, but not all things are helpful. First a sermon question whenever we're dealing something in a gray area is, is this helpful for my discipleship to Jesus Christ? Does this make me more like Jesus? And here in the context, it's not just about me. It's not just about an I. It's, does this, is this helpful for the community? Is this helpful for others to grow like Christ? All things are lawful, but not all things are helpful. All things are lawful, but not all things build up. What's the second one? Is the action that I'm doing, is what I'm, what, I'm, what I'm taking part in, helping to build up another person in Christ? Or perhaps even myself in Christ? Those are two discernment questions he's giving us with these statements. Now he goes into the second principle that we mentioned earlier. Remember, the first principle is do not commit idolatry. The second principle is do not leave a stumbling block in the road for another person to come to the gospel. What does he say in verse 24? Let no one seek his or her own good, but the good of his neighbor. What is he saying? Don't do stuff out of selfish ambition or selfish rights or, or just because I want to. What do we do it out of? We do it out of love for the neighbor. We take our neighbor in priority over ourselves. Now you would almost then expect them to immediately say, so don't eat the meat in the meat market. That might cause some to stumble. He says the exact opposite. Do you notice that in the, in the freedom that he gives Christians? Look what he says, verse 25. Eat whatever's sold in the meat market without raising any question on the ground of conscience. So even for those on weak conscience who don't want to eat meat sacrificed to idols at all, he's telling them, go and eat the meat. Don't even ask the question if it was sacrificed to an idol. Don't even look at the label. Right? You know how we have labels, organic, and then everything else is non-organic, and some people want to find the label, let's just find the organic. He's like, don't even check out the labels. Don't even worry about it. Don't think about it. Don't investigate it. Don't look it up online. Don't Google search it. Nothing. Just go, buy the meat, partake. Done. Interesting. So that's the first step of advice. If it's not meat in the temple and it's not connected specific to a religious festival, go and eat it. Then what is he saying? Here's his reasoning, and this is so important. His reasoning is based on Scripture. Here he quotes Psalm 24, 1. And he says, For the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. What's he mean? Well, basically he's saying, after... You know, if after this religious ceremony or event, after it clears the temple, it belongs to the Lord again. It doesn't belong to the idols or any spiritual beings behind them. It's the Lord's. So what do we do? Partake with thankfulness and you're good to go. But then he 
defines it. He's going to put it, give us some situations here. And this is how it is with areas in the gray um, area, so to speak. When things are in the gray area, sometimes things are situational. Look what he says. He first says, eat it without even thinking about it. Verse 27. If one of the unbelievers invites you to dinner and you are disposed to go, eat whatever is set before you without raising any question on the ground of conscience. So remember the situation here. It's not another believer. The issue is an unbeliever inviting you over to dinner in their house. You partake with thankfulness. Boom. Done. Don't worry about it. Don't ask the host, hey, was this sacrificed to an idol or used in some other religious con? Nope. Don't even worry about it. Just eat. Praise God. But... Verse 28, but if someone says to you, this has been offered in sacrifice, what's the scenario? Remember, we're dealing with an unbeliever asking you over to dinner. And remember, we're, we're 2,000 years ago, we're in Corinth. They ask us as a Corinthian over to dinner. The unbeliever takes special effort. And as they lay the meat on the table, they tell you, this was sacrificed to an idol. Now, why do they do that? Well, most likely it's because they have some sense of moral obligation to tell you as a Christian that this is sacrificed to an idol, expecting you not to participate. They're expecting that. And what is Paul saying? Then do not eat it. For the sake of the one who informed you and for the sake of conscience. I do not mean your conscience, but his. All right, so what's he saying? Well, actually, this unbeliever is expecting you as a Christian to act in a certain way, meaning not partake of the idol, fulfill his wish, lay down your right to that, why? So that they may be saved. It's going to be for the sake of the gospel. And that you're going to find a little bit later on. It's for the sake of the gospel. Okay? It's for the sake that there's no obstacle put in his way of conscience for him. It continues on. Verse 29 I do not mean your conscience, but his. For why should my liberty be determined by someone else's conscience? Now this seems contradictory at first. right? Paul is laying down this argument. Hey, when you're with the house of an unbeliever, and they say, you, this, this meat was sacrificed to an idol, don't participate, don't eat it. But then he's saying, but don't let the other person determine your conscience. Or don't be enslaved to their conscience, I should say. Don't be enslaved to their conscience. Now, how does that work? What he means is this. We as Christians are totally free. And in this non-essential area of meat, it is not a big deal if you eat, and it's not a big deal if you don't eat. Therefore, you can freely lay down your right for the sake of loving another person. It's not your conscience that's determined. It's not his conscience that's determining you. You determine you. And in love, you lay down the right. Why? Remember, it is not I who live, but who lives in me? Christ who lives in me. We are mastered by Christ and do it for the sake of the gospel. Right? So we preserve our freedom. Here's the thing. If someone was to insist in this manner of eating, then they've made the food a big deal. But it wasn't a big deal. If someone insisted on not eating, they've suddenly made it a big deal. But it wasn't a big deal. And so what we do, we do freely. No concern. Oh, it's not a big deal. I can avoid meat this meal. Eh. One way or the other. Okay? That's the attitude here. Verse 30. If I partake with thankfulness, why am I denounced because of that for which I give thanks? Right, so this is, again, he's referring back to the earlier argument, and he's saying, look, if I'm, if I'm eating meat that's in the meat market, and I give thanks for it and give a blessing for it, why should anyone denounce me? Right? 
Why should, I, why should anyone come against me? And it would be the same thing in the household of the unbeliever. As long as the unbeliever doesn't say anything to him, he can partake with thankfulness and not worry about it. And shouldn't be denounced for it. Now you'll remember this actually links up with what we've been talking about before. Specifically in 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verses 19 through 24. And in that section, what you would find is that Paul is defending himself because people think he's sort of wishy-washy. In some contexts, he'll eat meat, and in other contexts, he won't. And he lays down this principle, actually, I did it for the sake of the gospel, and it could be one or the other. And he's then saying to people today, in, in, in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, he's saying, look, either way in this gray area that you go, if you do it with thankfulness, you're all right. Then he comes down home on the principle again, verse 31. So whether you eat or drink, or whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. How do we discern something in the gray area? Do whatever we do to the glory of God. Put on our spectacles of eternity. Think about Christ living in me, and then make the decision of what to do. That's how that works. Do all to the glory of God. And it's going to be patterned by don't put a stumbling block before others. Give no offense to Jews or to Greeks or to the church of God. Just as I try to please everyone in everything I do, not seeking my own advantage, but that of the many, that they may be saved. What happens in the gray area? Choose what will promote the gospel and give glory to God. That's the heart of what's being said in this section. And then Paul gives this firm guidance. Be imitators of me as I am of Christ. Now we need to then apply this to our lives very carefully so that there are less, uh, less confusion in, in the practical application. We've already had the practical application and do not commit idolatry. Here's the second step of the practical application. It is not a gray area if Scripture is already clear on the matter. It is not a gray area if Scripture is already clear on the matter. Don't try to put something in the gray area if Scripture is quite clear on it. Okay, we need, to, we need to assert this because many times people are trying to shove things that are clearly listed as sin into the gray area and say, well, this is a matter of discernment. Well, no, that's not a matter of discernment. Scripture is already clear on the issue. Right? So we need to partake. Gray area stuff is this. What TV program should I watch? Well, Scripture is not going to have much to say about that other than, well, avoid the obvious sins on TV. Right? You don't want to be watching other people's sin on TV. It's inviting it into your home. Right? But, all right, so, well, can I watch this show? Can I watch that show? Well... Who cares? <laughs> That's the answer. Does it build you up? Does it build other people up? Does it help in your discipleship to Christ? If it doesn't help in your discipleship to Christ, why are we watching it? If it's neutral, well, okay, so we're just wasting time. We have to, that's a gray area, all right? So we, we have to partake of, we have to think about things like that. And there are many gray area things that are not clear that we then must apply biblical discernment to. Asking those questions is so important. Number two, sometimes what is the right thing to do in a situation and making use of our right is offensive. Paul says in this text, Give no offense to Jews or to Greeks or to the church of God, just as I try to please everyone in everything I do. Well, he's not a people pleaser in other contexts. So what does this mean? Turn with me to Matthew chapter 9, verse, verses 9 through 13. Matthew chapter 9, verses 9 through 13. This is Jesus himself. 
in a gray area about eating with other Jewish sinners. Here he goes. As Jesus passed on from there, he saw a man called Matthew sitting at the tax booth, and he said to him, follow me. He rose and followed him. As Jesus reclined at the table in the house, behold, many tax collectors and sinners came and were reclining with Jesus and his disciples. Getting out the gospel. And when the Pharisees saw this, they said to his disciples, Why does your teacher eat with tax collectors and sinners? The Pharisees are offended. He shouldn't be doing that. Why is he doing it? And Jesus then says, But when he heard it, he said, Those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick. Go and learn what this means. I desire mercy and not sacrifice. For I came not to call the righteous, but sinners. What happens? Jesus is in this gray area of eating with other Jewish sinners, and really sinners. The tax collectors are on the way outside. And he goes and eats with them. What for? The purpose of the gospel. Supported by Scripture. That's how he makes his discernment. But he offends people in the process. The Pharisees are like, what's Jesus doing? Okay? Number three, Christians should not judge other Christians for gray area matters, if indeed it is a gray area. Turn with me to Romans chapter 14. Romans chapter 14 is also specifically about food matters, but it applies again to the gray area matters. He says this, starting in verse 13. Therefore, let us not pass judgment on one another any longer, but rather decide never to put a stumbling block or a hindrance in the way of a brother. I know and am persuaded in the Lord Jesus that nothing is unclean in itself, but it is unclean for anyone who thinks it's unclean. For if your brother is grieved by what you eat, you are no longer walking in love. By what you eat, do not destroy the one for whom Christ died. So do not let what you regard as good be spoken of as evil. For the kingdom of God is not a matter of eating and drinking, but of righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. Whoever thus serves Christ is acceptable to God and approved by men. So then let us pursue what makes for peace and for mutual upbuilding. This is about gray areas. And he says, here's the thing about gray areas. The kingdom of God isn't about that. What's it about? Righteousness, which is clear in Scripture what that is. Righteousness, joy, and peace in the Holy Spirit. And don't do what makes another person stumble. And don't judge one another. Okay? So, then the question becomes, well, how do we help another believer with issues in the gray area? Do we just throw up our hands and go, well, I guess this doesn't really matter or God doesn't care? No. Always help people by asking the questions that Paul himself is looking to make us ask. Is this particular action helpful for your discipleship to Christ? Does it edify you? What are the other effects on people around you in the community? Those are the discernment questions we ask people. So we might say to a brother or a sister, Hey, you know, I've noticed that every time I walk into your house, the TV is on. It looks like it's on. For how many hours are you watching TV per day? Well, I'm not really watching. It's just on in the background. But then you work on them and it comes out they're watching TV like six hours every day. Well, you're not to judge or condemn the person, but you're to help them by asking, is watching TV six hours a day helpful for your discipleship to Christ? Does that lift you up and edify you? Now, most of us, if we have ever had a binge experience, know the zombie feeling that comes over one as they've watched television for an hour or two or three. Does anybody know what I'm talking about? Maybe not. I'll just, I'll just say, I've, I've, I've done this by, and it's not a mistake, it was a sin, and I've done this, but I've been to watch things. And as you watch, there's actually like this zombie effect that comes over. And all of a sudden, we feel way worse at the end of that two or three hours than we did at the beginning. Okay? Then the question comes in, is it helpful? 
Well, honestly, no, it's not helpful. Does it build you up? Uh, no, it makes me feel like a zombie. Then the next obvious question is, well, then why are you doing that? Right? That's how we help people with matters in the gray area. In gray areas, there are two guardrails Paul puts up. First, do not commit idolatry. Second, do not put a stumbling block before another in reaching the gospel. The third principle is, if scripture is clear, let it be clear. All else is a matter for discernment. More specific situations and scenarios may need prayer or discussion. You're more than welcome to invite me into those discussions if you want, or a greater searching of the scripture in order to figure it out. Let us live for Christ, for he lives in us. Let us pray. Our Father, we thank you so very much for your goodness and your love. Lord God, we thank you so much for who you are. Holy Spirit, we now pray that you would be with us. Lord Jesus, guide us rightly on the many gray areas in life. Help us to be firm and stand firm on things that are clear. And let us always live by faith in the Son of God. Thank you. In the precious name of Jesus Christ we pray. Amen.